Dinosaur Provincial Park is known for its stunning landscapes and rich fossil beds. Recently, it's gained additional attention due to the discovery of white nose syndrome in a bat, marking the first case in Alberta. This area around Dinosaur Provincial Park has been highlighted by biologists for monitoring after it was discovered that the fungus that can cause white nose syndrome was present in a sample of bat guano. But up to this point, it had not been detected in a bat. It was confirmed that the bat has developed white nose syndrome, which you can see here as orange spots on the wings, meaning the fungus has penetrated the wing tissue. The more fungus present, the worse the impacts of the disease are. Luckily for this bat, the infection is not too serious yet. This is a disease that's unique to bats, and it's caused by a fungus that grows in cold areas such as caves where bats hibernate. And it was first discovered in 2006 in a cave in New York. And what happens is once the fungus starts to grow and proliferate in a cave and the bats go in to hibernate, it gets on the bats, it disrupts some physiological processes and in simplistic terms, it irritates the bats, they wake up from hibernation. The problem is if it's the middle of winter, there's no food. Since the discovery of the disease, millions of bats have died across North America making the monitoring program of great importance. So that's why we're here tonight. Exactly. Obviously, um, there's been enough research done that you know that this is a, a, a bat area and bats do fly through here. So talk about the process a little bit. How do you go about catching these little guys? Sure, we use mist nets, which are also used for birds. So very fine nets that to us, we. Once they're up and it's dark, we can't see them. And bats with their echolocation actually can see them. So it's a bit challenging. We have to kind of trick the bats a little bit and put them in places where they may not be paying a lot of attention. Maybe they're just flying around or they have a full belly and they can't turn as quickly. And they're not in an area where they're used to just going out and flying. They're not expecting this obstacle. So we'll surprise them. And uh, so we will be able to catch them. It's, it's an effective way of doing that. And we're gonna catch them and look at what the species is and weigh them and measure them. And then obviously we're gonna be looking for signs of white nose syndrome. The bats may also not have white nose syndrome but still have evidence of the fungus, which we can detect by taking swabs, just a cotton swab that we rub on their wings and send it to a lab. It is challenging to see bats flying around at night, so biologists rely on specialized listening devices to let them know if the bats are around. Okay, this is uh, an echometer touch, which is a small bat detector that um, can plug into, depending on what kind of detector and phone you have, an iPhone or Android, um, at 40 uh, kilohertz. So that little that you heard, and you saw the little spectic gun go across there. That was a bat. So we know it's here. I guess what's the purpose of monitoring this if, you know, there's at this stage, there's no known cure? We want to know what's happening to our bat populations. Uh, we don't know if the impact is going to be as severe as it was in eastern North America. There's a few variables that are a little bit different here. So that's one thing. And while we're also tracking the fungus and white nose syndrome, we're gonna be monitoring our bat populations a lot more closely to understand that. And bats are really, really important because they are the primary consumer of nocturnal insects. So they have a really important role for controlling pests, mosquitoes, as well as farm and forest pests as well. And by learning more about it, we may be able to help them. There's quite a bit of research that's been going on, looking at different ways to see, could you destroy the fungus in a cave? Got to be careful because there's a, a, an ecosystem in there. Can we somehow vaccinate the bats? There's a project that's been ongoing in BC for several years now, organized by a number of universities, and they've identified that bats have natural bacteria on their wings, and they've isolated some of them which seem to repel the fungus. 
So they've been concentrating it into a paste that um, is referred to as a probiotic paste. And so think about you've got this paste that might help protect the bats when they go into a hibernation site, but how do you put it on the bats? And if we know where they are in the summer, for example, little brown bats, the females often roost in large numbers in buildings where they have their young, called a maternity colony. They go in and out of small openings. So if we were able to put the paste in that small opening, the bats would be coating themselves and hopefully they go to the, the cave in the fall or wherever they're hibernating. It may not be a cave, could be cracks and crevices. We don't know all the places and uh, they're going to be less susceptible to that fungus bothering them. How many different species of bats are in Alberta and is white nose syndrome, does it affect all species of that's, bats? That's an excellent question. We have nine species that we know of and it only affects bats that hibernate. So six of our bats hibernate. I will add that since it's coming from Eastern North America, there's a couple of species in Alberta that aren't found further east. So there's no record yet of whether they are susceptible to it. We suspect they will be. And that's one of the really interesting things we're looking at tonight is we're gonna be catching a species of bat called the Western small-footed. The Eastern small-footed is susceptible to it. We don't know about the Western small-footed, probably, but that's gonna be interesting. Talk a little bit about some of the other threats to bats in Alberta in terms of habitat and, and their potential flyways, uh, that right. type of thing. Well, there's lots of areas where bats like to roost, natural roost, big old trees. Number one favorite place for bats to roost, especially fe and here, especially females who, have, who are raising pups, they need uh, to be able to get into a cavity in a tree or under loose bark. Here in Dinosaur, in the coolies, there's lots of cracks and crevices that they can just go to. They're not using the trees so much, but you start getting out of this area, trees are going to be the number one place for those females with pups. And so that's a really important habitat that we need to protect. So the natural areas, big trees, natural vegetation, wetlands, those are all excellent, excellent spots for bats. Unfortunately, white nose syndrome is not the only threat our bats face. In an upcoming story, we'll examine some of the challenges that our migrating bat populations must navigate through.